Good morning. I am really excited to start our very first video about Psalms and Songs, which is going to be our summer study. Um, I think we're going to have a lot of fun with this, and I will try this morning to give you some um, insights that I've found, not really all from just my head and heart, but from some studying I've done. And so they won't be um, in any particular order because what I'm trying to do is let you take what you've already figured out with your guidance of the Holy Spirit and then um, pour it in, pour this on, on top of that as a layer so that we're getting lots of understanding about this psalm. This is to me one of the most beautiful psalms because we're starting with Psalm 84. <clears throat> and um, so just want to give you some extra insights that I've found, again, through the commentaries and through study. I'm going to have to look at my notes a lot, so tolerate me going up and down just a little bit. Okay. First of all, this is a um, one of the Psalms of the Sons of Korah, is what this is called. And um, it's a beautiful psalm about um, and from the psalmist who just loves God so much that it's almost too beautiful for him to express. It's just almost more than he can put into words. Okay, so he so he begins with, how lovely is your dwelling place? It's almost that idea of an English teacher teaching kids put an exclamation mark. How is not always a question. Sometimes it's just a, a statement of amazement. How lovely is your dwelling place? And if you look up the use of the word lovely, it really um, translates well as how beloved. So when we think about, <clears throat> excuse me, how beloved something is to us, that's so important. And he says that his soul yearns for the courts of the Lord. You know, yearning is a very deep longing. It's, it's not something we just want uh, for a moment, but that deep, deep longing. And he yearns for the courts of the Lord um, to the point that his heart and flesh cry out. Um, he's not crying out for a physical temple. He's not crying out for, you know, the, the beauty of the of the temple like the candlesticks and the altar he's crying out for God himself wanting more of God himself if you go back into the Old Testament and you remember uh, that there were the 12 tribes of Israel um, each tribe was given land in the promised land except the Levites because the Levites were given God himself and that's important to remember because they were to be taken care of by everybody else well this psalmist is yearning for God himself um, he talks about um, in, um, let me find it, um, well it says near your altars, but again he's not thinking about the altar itself, he's thinking about being near God. Okay, how happy are those who reside in your house who praise you continually? Again, another exclamatory statement, how happy we are because we get to be with you continually. And then he talks about in the next chunk of the text, starting with verse 5, happy are the people whose strength is in you, whose hearts are set on pilgrimage. As they pass through the valley of Baca, they make it a source of spring water. Even the autumn rain will cover it with blessings. They go from strength to strength, and each appears before God in Zion. I wanted to read that because I want to camp there for just a second. Um, he says they go from strength to strength. And what this really suggests to us, if you read the commentaries, is that um, we are a people who depend on God for our strength. And so we go from this time of strength that God has provided to this time of strength to this time of strength. But the folks understand that as they're on pilgrimage, and, and in their world it would have been pilgrimage to Jerusalem, that God is with them giving them their strength. Our pilgrimage is different. Um, our pilgrimage is about the pilgrimage of um, walking out this life and being faithful to God in the walking, being faithful to God in the journey. We are on a journey. We, are, we do not reach a destination um, until we end up in heaven. And so our pilgrimage is walking toward God constantly in, the, in His sanctifying grace. And so that idea of strength to strength, um, we go from strength to strength. And then I want to address this idea of the Valley of Baca. Um, this is an image that would suggest our times of adversity. And I don't know about you, I feel like there's just been a lot of times of adversity in, in recent days and in recent years. And you can think of yours too. But, um, but in the Valley of Baca, I want to go back to the text, they make it a source of spring water and even the autumn rains will cover it with blessings and the suggestion of that is is that god alone can turn our times of adversity 
into times of blessing. And that is really, really a powerful image because I don't know anything in the world that can do that except God. You know, there's the passage um, in the New Testament that talks about, um, um, I will thank you in all things, and I will praise you in all things, even for the difficult things. But that's because we're not thanking him for the bad things, but that in all things, he blesses us and gives us this strength. It goes on to say in the next section of text, starting with verse 8, and I love this these two images. It says, Lord God of hosts, hear my prayer. He is calling out to a God who he knows is a listener. But then he says, consider our shield, God, and look on the face of your anointed one. So there are two things I want to bring out there. God is our shield. And I want to find another word. Hang on just a second. Oh, it's in the next chunk, so let me let me hold that thought. But God is our shield. He is our protection. Go back to the armor of God. We put we pick up our shield because a shield is a source of protection. If you go back to um, fighting times, um, back when England was trying to form itself and the Danes and the Vikings were coming against England and, and medieval times, what they would do is they would take those shields, and in Roman times, and they would create a shield wall. And the first fighters would have shields that covered the bottom of the body. It, it kind of stood up like this, shield by shield by shield. And so it protected you from kind of the, the legs down. And then the next group would put the shield above the face. Theirs would be at a second layer of the wall. And then the third group would drop their shields above this way. This is kind of hard to show on this video, but I wanted you to see it because they created a shield wall. If you go back in the types of shields that they used in Roman times, they were shaped in a way that when you put them together in a circle, it created almost a turtle shell effect. And so those fiery darts of the enemy could not get to them because the shields were soaked in water and the, uh, the arrows would fall away because they, were, um, they would hit that watery shield and that shield that was covering them like a turtle shell. So God is our shield. That is a powerful image for so many reasons. I don't know about you, but one of the things I've been thinking about today is what are the times in my life, very particular times, that God has been my shield? When maybe sometimes I knew it and other times I wasn't even aware of it, but He had His shield of protection all over my life. And I want that to be something you think about. When has God protected you when you, looking back, you know it, but maybe at the time you didn't even realize it. So, the next part uh, repeats, um, well, no, excuse me, I'm sorry. It says that thing that shows up in our song, Better is One Day. Better is a day in your courts than a thousand elsewhere. I would rather be at the door of the house of my God than to live in the tents of wicked people. For the Lord God is a sun and a shield. Now, here's where we hear shield again. But I love this because he partners it with sun and shield. I looked, at, I looked this up, and in the Bible, the only time that those words are partnered together, talking about God, is right here. That God is not only our sun, but also our shield. So when you think about He is our sun, He gives us the brightness of walking with Him, the joy that comes from the light. And of course, later we know in the New Testament, Jesus becomes our light in the darkness. And so it almost is, to me, I, I'm not saying this is what the commentators say, but it's almost a reference to Jesus later will be our sun, our light our S-O-N and our S-U-N. But he is our sun and our shield, which suggests that he covers us in the beautiful good times and he shields us in the difficult times. Um, so finally, well, let me get back. Better is one day in your courts. That's such a powerful image. I don't need to explain that to you. This psalmist loved the Lord so much that better is, if he, if he could only live a single day with God, it would be better than a thousand days living in the tents of the wicked. And honestly, i got to tell you something. We are living today in the tents of the wicked. We are living with a world that is, that is approving things that we know are not scriptural. It, the world is approving um, you know, abortion and sin of all kinds and, and nothing new that wasn't happening in the Bible times, honestly, 
And yet it's magnified in our minds because it's on social media and it's on the news every night and the minute something happens, the news breaks into our world and flashes these um, shotgun moments. I, I, uh, I, there was a passage I read a long time ago, like shotgunning, like um, splattering shotgun news all over us. And so we do live in the tents of the wicked. And so we have to be so intentional that we are instead looking to our God, who is our only hope, our only hope. Um, in the final uh, section of text, he says the Lord gives grace and glory. He does not withhold good from those who live with integrity. Happy is the one who trusts in you, Lord of hosts. You know, I love this image. He gives grace and glory. And it doesn't say a little bit, and it doesn't say just today. I believe very clearly that as we are on this pilgrimage, that would suggest that we are, we have God's supply of never-ending grace. And that when we walk in His grace, then there's a never-ending supply of glory because we glorify Him, not because we glorify self. We talked about that at Bible study Tuesday night, but we glorify Him. Uh, you know, we are so beloved people of God. You know, it says somewhere in this psalm that even the sparrow finds a home and, and in the near the altars. And if God takes care of those sparrows, how much more does he care for the people who are modeled in his image? How powerful is that, is that image? Um, one commentator mentioned, and this kind of goes back to something else in the psalm, as we depend on God for strength, that one of the things is we get God's um, best. And even, even if we got God's weakest moment, not that there is one. I'm trying to make an image, though. It would be better than the devil's best. And so as the devil comes against us, and he has sure attacked me, Sunday I thought, I'm going to crumble under this crushing weight. But I knew I wasn't. But boy, it was heavy on Sunday, and it was Satan attacking, attacking, attacking. But you know what? God's, God's single moment, one day in his court, is better than all that the devil can throw at us, and we have to remember that. Um, and God never withholds his blessings. He, and it says for people who walk in integrity, I want to be very clear. I don't want ever to be discouraged because we can't be perfect. Well, I walked in integrity yesterday, but today's not so good. Well, we have to remember that that God knows we're not going to be perfect, which is why we have His Son, which is why we have a never-ending supply of grace, a never-ending supply of forgiveness, and all we do have to do is but ask Him, God, I need Your grace today. I need You to forgive me for whatever. And maybe it's a thing that, like me, there's something you struggle with day after day after day. It's very frustrating because there's a thing that gets me all the time. And it, it makes me so mad with myself. And yet God says very clearly, there's grace every morning. We're going to later study um, the psalm from which the writer took greatest thy faithfulness. Your mercies are new every single day, God. And so we are so blessed. We are so blessed. A never-ending supply. I want to mention one other thing. This psalm, and I mentioned this on your sheets, but it's written in first person. Now, I'm an English teacher, so this matters to me. When the psalmist wrote, he wrote in a very personal manner. When we write in first person, it suggests that we are there. We're in the midst of the story. If you've forgotten your English... When we write in third person, we're telling the story, but we're not in the story. We're in almost like an outside observer. This is written in first person. My God, I long and yearn for you. Um, now, he does talk about happy are those who set their peace pilgrimage on you and their faces on you. But that's because he's talking about others as well as himself. But he says, consider our shield, God. Everything about this makes this a very personal psalm. And so the truth is, one of the things you can do is read this psalm. Put your name in it. Listen to this. Listen to this. Lord God of hosts, hear Jean's prayer. It, it, listen, God of Jacob. Consider the shield of the women in this study, God. Look on the face of your anointed one, Jean. Your anointed one, Melinda, your anointed one, Phyllis, your anointed one, Dawn. We could go through the list of every one. And I encourage you to do that. 
Let that be during the coming week. One of your prayers is that you pray this psalm back to God. I love to call out his words to him because he has given them to us. I want to call them out and say, God, you remember that you promised to be my son and my shield. Well, I need your shield today as I walk through the journey. Okay? Um, what a beautiful psalm. No wonder that Matt Redman, who's an incredible writer, decided to create this beautiful song from this. And I don't need to explain this because he takes it directly from this psalm. Um, you know, how lovely is your dwelling place, O Lord Almighty, my soul longs. It even faints for you. Here's where my heart is satisfied within your presence. And I love that line he uses, I stand beneath the shadow of your wings. There's, that's mentioned multiple times in the psalms. One thing I ask, and I would see, just to see your beauty. I just want to see it, God. I just want to see it. I want to find you there where you dwell, which is on the throne of heaven, and Jesus at the right hand of the Father. I love this. And, and as we can use this psalm and this song, I've given you the link. I pray that you'll just turn that link on and sit and let it wash over you. I love Matt Redman. I love anybody who takes beautiful words of Scripture and brings them to life for us through music. I hope you will use this as a reflection time, remembering to think about how does this apply to you today. And this psalm particularly, I feel like applies to me deeply today and to all of you. Think about the prayer requests we've made in recent weeks. We need God as our sun and shield. We need to know that when we call out His name, we live in His presence. We need to know that that lovely dwelling place is waiting for us today in his presence, on our knees, on our faces, in our cars as we lift up his name, and in our churches. But it's also available to us in the long run because we know that in heaven we have a beautiful inheritance that we get to live in eternity with God because of the sacrifice of the Son, the perfect Son. I want to mention one other thing as we close. Consider your church today. Consider your part in your church today. Consider how your church is more than just programs, but is a chance for us to go to church and meet the living God, to worship, to praise, to call out. And so that's going to be, beyond your study, my challenge to you this week is that as you enter church on Wednesday or Sunday or Saturday, whenever you go, that you would call out, <clears throat> excuse me, got to get these glasses off, to your living God and worship Him and go into church with the expectation that He has something to say. Not your pastor, not your teacher, but that He has something to say through your pastor, through your teacher. Because teachers and pastors and ministers, they're just vessels. They are vessels. If they are walking faithfully with God, they, we, are vessels to carry the word to people, but God is the one who makes the word make sense. God is the one who sent the word. I hope that's how you'll enter church this week with the great expectation of meeting God there. Not having your needs met or being happy with the look of the church or the song they sang that morning, but meeting the living God who is our sun and our shield and how lovely it is <clears throat> to dwell in that place with him. Thank you for joining this adventure that we're going to have this summer. I hope in the future they won't be quite this long, our videos, but I needed to kind of get us started and how is this going to look. I am so excited to be able to hang out with you and know that you are out there studying God's Word it gives my heart big joy this morning. I love you all. Put on the armor of God, the belt of truth. Put on that helmet. Pick up that shield today and know that you are protected by the armor of Almighty God, a warrior who saves. I love y'all so much. I'll talk to you soon. Bye.